Welcome everyone. Welcome to everybody who's logging in. There are many people who are logging in as we speak. Welcome to each of you. We are gonna get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, do us a favor and let us know where you're uh, logging in from. And you could put uh, in the chat and just tell us uh, where you're from. And we're glad that you're with us. There are hundreds of people so far who have logged in. And let's see where some of you are coming from. And it is from all over. I see Jerusalem, Toronto, Berlin, Skokie, Illinois, Charlotte, North Carolina, people in New York, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Connecticut, London, Atlanta, Georgia, England, the Red Sea. Okay, welcome. Rishon Zion in Israel, Vancouver, Canada, Baltimore, Cleveland, Seattle, Philadelphia, Palo Alto, Austin, Manchester. For those of you just logging in, uh, we'll start in about a minute. Let us know where you're logging in from. We're glad you're with us. I see people from Talmud in Israel, Santa Barbara, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Silver Spring, Pasadena, Ramat Gan, Silver Spring, Madison, Wisconsin, someone else from Vancouver, Delray Beach, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Mexico, Denver, the Netherlands, everybody, the Finland, Scotland. Um, wow, we have people from all over the world joining us today. We are glad that you're with us. Um, Muncie, Hawaii, um, Los Angeles, England, Scottsdale, Arizona, New Zealand. We are very well represented on multiple continents today. <laughs> um, okay, it is right at the three o'clock mark here in New York City. And uh, my name is Avram Grohl, and I serve as uh, Executive Director of Jewish Gen, and I'm glad to welcome you to today's Jewish Gen Talk. We are uh, very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Uh, Thomas Fjord, if I pronounced that properly, I hope I did, talking about surnames, so I hope I did that correctly. Um, today's talk is part of our ongoing series of educational webinars that we call Jewish Gen Talks, and uh, please be on the lookout for additional talks in the future, both now and in the spring, and then we have another series planned for the fall, and more information will be uh, put out about it. Um, just a couple of notes before we get started. As always, the session is being recorded and the video will be available on the Jewish Gen YouTube channel. We'll post an announcement on the discussion group when the video is ready and we'll also send out an email. If you are not on the discussion group, please join. It's a tremendous way to connect with thousands of other researchers from around the world. You can ask questions, you could share success, you could ask people for research advice, you can stay informed of webinars like this one. So please, please join the discussion group. And if you're on Facebook, join the Jewish Genealogy Portal so you can stay aware. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions towards the end of the program. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A and Dr. Furet will uh, read through them or try to read through as many as possible and uh, answer them towards the end of the program. Dr. Furet has graciously um, agreed to make his contact information available to all of you. Um, so if you have any specific questions afterwards, um, he is glad to field them. We'll include his information uh, in the follow-up email that goes out later today. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Fjord, our speaker. He lives in Stockholm in Sweden. He is the Associate Professor of History at Stockholm University. He serves as President of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Sweden. The, the Genealogical Society of Sweden, and he's the Avotenu contributing editor for Sweden. So he is uh, a world-renowned effort, and we are glad that so many people from around the world are joining us for today. And with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Fjord. Yes, thank you, Avram. And I'm going to um, share my slides here. Yeah, here we are. Um, so 
Um, this lecture is about how to trace your ancestors before they got fixed surnames. But I will start here. I will start with the question, when did Jews get fixed surnames? Uh, you probably know that Sephardic Jews began to use surnames already 1,000 years ago. And uh, most of them had surnames when they were expelled from Spain and Portugal 500, well, more than 500 years ago. But very few Ashkenazi Jews used surnames before the late uh, 1700. And it's a very um, easy explanation for that because Ashkenazi Jewish people uh, adopted uh, fixed surnames by force, you could say. It was the sovereign in the countries where you were living that um, implemented uh, laws, man mandatory laws that Jewish people must have a fixed surname. And first out was the uh, Austrian emperor, Joseph II. And uh, he uh, had his law uh, uh, from uh, July 1787. You see it here, the, the cover of it, uh, the, Das Patent über die Judenamen. And it uh, was not only a law of uh, stating that Jewish people must have a fixed surname. It said a lot of other things too, that all Jewish vital records should be written in German. They had, uh, been written in Hebrew or in Yiddish, and uh, that also Jewish people in uh, the Austrian Empire must have German given names too. But uh, I will stick to the, uh, the fixed surname question. Um, and uh, um, Joseph II was not uh, um, he was the first sovereign to have such a law, but he was soon followed by other. The Russian Tsar, for instance, had a law already in 1804, but it took half a century before it was implemented. And then followed Napoleon in France in 1808. And then, of course, a lot of those small uh, kingdoms and principalities and and uh, duchies uh, and even free cities that uh, Germany consisted out of. You see a map here, and it's quite another map uh, we have today of Europe, but we have the great Habsburg Austrian Empire in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. We have uh, Prussia, uh, the king, uh, German kingdom that, uh, in the 1870s became the, uh, the German Empire. And, um, but up to then, we have all these small uh, German kingdoms and uh, free cities and so on. And the last of them to have a law uh, stating that Jewish people must have fixed surname the last one of them was the Grand Duchy of Nassau, a small uh, country in the southern of Germany. Before the, eight, the late 18th century, most Ashkenazi Jews used patronymics, if they had any surname at all. Patronymics is not a surname, really. Uh, you, uh, it's a... Uh, second name, you, you use it, of course, to dis distinguish people from each other that have the same given name. But uh, a patronymic is made out of the given name of your father. Uh, uh, so it changes every um, generation. Uh, some have also matronymics. It was not so common, but there were families that used metronymics. Then you, you used your mother's given name as your second name or as your uh, sir, pre-surname or what you should call it. 
Uh, and then you had also uh, nicknames uh, that you used as surnames, especially in the big cities you know, where there were uh, bigger uh, Jewish uh, population. Patronymic, it's uh, like this, Moses Abraham, Moses son of Abraham. And it changed every generation due to the fact that the father has a new name, of course. Sometimes he could have the same name as his own father, and then it changed, didn't change. But that's, that's uncommon. Matronymics is the same. If you choose, instead of your father's given name, you choose your mother's given name. But then you have a, a version of that, or what, I, I have no name of it, but it was not uncommon. You, you use the given name of your wife. So uh, Moshe Gittelman had a wife called Gittel, for instance, but that changed also every generation. So, Let's go to the question. Lecture, how to do and what to look for. I think uh, I have some small advice here. I think you must use a broad research strategy. You, you should search for siblings in every generation because uh, uh, then you could avoid uh, brick walls. And you should also, if you can, use a collaborative family tree for instance, Gini, yeah, be, because then you, you could uh, take advantage of what other researchers has done. And uh, you need to have this broad strategy to, to find out what type of uh, uh, patronymic your ancestors, ancestors used before they got a fixed surname. Note also, if possible, the given name of the firstborn boy in each generation. Why? Yes, because you know, Ashkenazi Jewish people name their children after deceased relatives. And if uh, the father, uh, uh, the grandfather was deceased, the partner, uh, partner uh, grandfather, then the firstborn boy got his name. And you could in some way figure out what sort of uh, um, patronymic uh, previous generation used if you knew the name of the firstborn boy, especially if you have a, a couple of siblings and you could see that they all gave their firstborn boy the same given name, then it's an indication that that could be the name of the grandfather. Look for censuses, tax records, house directory is, or estate records, and of course vital records, but vital records, there are very few vital records from the late 1800 the 18th century or the early 1800, the early 19th century. Because the vital record starts, yeah, in the beginning of the 1800, uh, some places in Bohemia, uh, for instance, in the late 1800, the uh, 18th century, sorry. Uh, and look also for lists of adopted fixed surnames, if there are such, uh, because that varies a lot. In, for instance, in Southern Germany, I have found a lot of, of such lists of, of, of uh, uh, when Jews adopted fixed surnames. They, they uh, tell you what the fixed surname certain people uh, adopted. Uh, and uh, I've seen such lists from uh, Russian Poland too, but they are very, uh, it's very seldom in, in, in uh, the Austrian Empire. I think I only uh, 
scene one from Prague. And beware of this also. You know, during the period when the new fit surnames were implemented, it, it took time because uh, uh, many Jews didn't like this. You know, people don't like changes. Many people don't like changes. And, and uh, so in the records, especially in, uh, in the beginning, when uh, the first decades after the, um, the law was, came and uh, was implemented, many records, uh, you will find both the new fixed surname and it was sometimes used in parallel with the old patronymics or matronymics. And I think you should also use different sources and of course evaluate them. And here you could see a lot of different sources. And I think the most uh, valuable sources when you're looking for patronymics or, or nicknames used as surnames before people adopted fixed surnames are census lists or tax lists, inventories. And um, sometimes it could be vital records, but that's seldom. Shevra Kadisha records or tombstone records are also a valuable uh, source. And tombstone also, because in a tradi traditional tombstone, as you probably know, uh, uh, there should be the name of the father of the buried person. Uh, and remember that we are now in the late 18th century, early uh, 19th century. This is the pre-modern world. So uh, the Hebrew name on the tombstone might be the name that people uh, used in every day too. It's not like when, when uh, we got into more secular societies in the late um, 19th century and in the 20th century. This is the traditional society where the Jewish people had their own society within the, the majority societies, so to say. Uh, I have my uh, ancestors mostly in Bohemia and in Hungary. And in Bohemia, we have uh, very special uh, records that you can use when you are looking for uh, uh, patronymics or, or, or nicknames used as surnames. For instance, there are marriage records for uh, most of the uh, 18th century. And there are a very special record called uh, familianten bücher, uh, family books, because in from 11, uh, 1811, every older Jewish person with a family had his own fami family position. And all male Jews were recorded in those books uh, during the first half of the uh, 19th century. And with some uh, info also back to, to uh, the late, uh, um, the second part of the 18th century. So now uh, I promise that uh, my lecture will be uh, mostly with case studies because I think as a family historian, you learn very much by reading and understanding how other people have done uh, with their family. Even if it's not your family, you can read, uh, you can learn a lot how to do and where to look uh, by uh, learning from case studies. Uh, so I will present three case studies here, two from Bohemia and one from Nassau in Southern Germany. And they are from different uh, centuries too. I will start with a man called Josef Stern or he died as Josef Stern, but he was born as Joshua Pinkas he was a brandy manufacturer, had his own distillery in a very small town in uh, southern Bohemia called Neu Bistritz. That was the German name. You will not find that name on a Google map today. It's uh, Novo Bistritz. My check is not very good, but something like that. 
but now we are in the late 18th century. And uh, uh, I know from the beginning, more or less, that his name was, uh, his pat patronymic could have been uh, Pincus, and that his name was, uh, given name was Joshua, uh, and that he died as Joseph Stern. Here we could see where he lived. You have a, a, a map up to the left, upper uh, corner left of present day Czech Republic. And South Bohemia, uh, 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 the South Bohemia is uh, the region in the Google map here uh, to the right, lower right. And here you see Neubistritz. And you see some other places that are connected to uh, the Stern family. Joseph Stern were, was living in, in Neubistritz. He had an older brother in Wittingau, that's Tribon today. His father, I figured out after a while that he, he died in Neuhaus. Jindrich uh, Horadik is the Czech name. And the older brother, Abram Stern, he had also a, a dis, distillery in Kardash Retschitz. And the family were from quite another town in uh, the western part of, of uh, South Bohemia in, uh, from Svihov, Svihov today. That I didn't know from the beginning at all. So here we have the Familianten book, uh, the family book of uh, uh, Joseph Stern. And here you could already in the book read that his uh, for, uh, earlier name, his former name was Joshel Pinkas. You see it here at, at uh, the, the Arab, the Red Arab. And it says here also in German, old and no, uh, or a new uh, name of the family, uh, the family and the uh, and the family Anton is Joseph Stern here. He had his family position in Neubistritz. And here you could read the name of his parents. His father was Elias Stern and his mother was Franziska Bord uh, Hirschmann. And he was uh, married to Barbara or Brendel Wutitz. And um, uh, he uh, was married 1775 or he got his marriage license because those uh, family uh, uh, they uh, they had the function of uh, controlling the Jewish uh, population so it was only the first born son that was allowed to marry and that's why they had these family books and the first um, uh, son here, his name was Wolf. He was born, first born son. He was born 1781. So let's go further. Uh, a good way of looking uh, at this uh, challenge to, to find out uh, what patronymic uh, were used in earlier generation is compare different sources from the time before the law was implemented and from the time after the law was implemented. And I have used here two censuses of the Jewish population in Bohemia, one for 1783 and one for 1793. And as I told you, the law came in 1787, so it was in between. So here we have uh, uh, from the census of 1793, it's in German, uh, the text in the census and, and uh, in the archives, you have to look for it with a title in, in Czech, but it's online today. And I have translated it into English here. In 1793, Elias Stern, it was the father of, of Joseph Stern or Joshua Pinkas. He died just before the census uh, was, uh, was recorded. Uh, and his widow was his second wife, Francisca of Fögele. Uh, Elias Stern had, had a, a distillery in, in uh, Neuhaus and he was a leaser of this distillery. 
uh, um, you had to lease the distillery the, 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 from the authorities, from the imperial authorities. This was a very common occupation among Jewish uh, people in, in uh, Bohemia. So he had been the leaser up to his death and uh, then uh, his uh, widow took over and she owned also a house in Schwiehau. This is the first time I noted that the family had lived in Schwiehau. And uh, Elias had two sons, uh, the oldest Abraham and uh, the second Joseph from Neubistritz. Abraham was from Wittinga. If we go to the census from 1783, the previous census before the mandatory uh, uh, law of to, uh, of the uh, adopt uh, fixed surnames. Uh, the leaser of the distillery was a man called Pinkas Wolf. And we knew from the beginning that Joseph was jo born Joshua Pinkas. So his patronym was Pinkas. So this is probably Elias Stern. He was born Pinkas Wolf. And he changed his uh, patronymic Wolf to Stern when he must, uh, when he was forced to adopt a fixed surname. And he changed even his given name. And uh, that was not uncommon. So let's go on to the oldest son, Abram Stern. He was also dead when the uh, census from, uh, uh, was recorded in 1793. He died in fact, 1791 and his wife died in 1792. I found them both in death records uh, and uh, in uh, vital death uh, records. But uh, they had two orphans, two boy orphans. They had some daughters too, uh, uh, but it was the, the boys that were recorded in the Familianten books. Uh, the firstborn uh, son, his name was Wolf. Remember now what the given name of the first son of the brother of uh, Abraham, Joseph's first son, what he, he named his firstborn son, Wolf. And now we see also in 1783, Abraham Pinkas had a distillery in Kardashret Sheets. The uh, census from 1783 has not so much information as the 1793 census. It says just that uh, Abraham Pincus had a di di was a leaser of a distillery and he, he was a woolen dealer also, and he was married and eight children, but no names. But he called himself Abraham Pincus, like Joshua Pincus uh, called himself in 1783. And their father was Pinkas Wolf. And they called both their sons, firstborn son, Wolf. So let's go on. Here is the marriage records for Neuhaus. Uh, it's uh, six marriage couple here, but we are interested in three. First, we have Abram Pinkas, the oldest brother, uh, married in 1766. Then we have Joshua Pinkas. Abraham Pinkas became Ab Abraham Stern. Joshua Pinkas became um, uh, Joseph uh, Stern. He married in 1775 uh, to Brendel or Barbara Boutitz. And here we have Pinkas Wolf. He married after his sons. Yeah, why? Yeah, we have already noted in the 1793 census that he uh, uh, had a second wife. The, his widow was his second wife. It, her name was Franziska in German and Fegele was her Yiddish name. And here we could read that Pinkas Wolf was married in 1778 uh, to his second wife Fegele from the town of Mislab. So now we, we know uh, a lot about, uh, sorry, it's too much. We should go. Yeah, yeah. Here we have the Familianten book for the son of uh, Abraham Stern. 
Uh, Abraham Stern died 1791. His first son was called, uh, named also Wolf, like uh, the brother Joseph. And what did Wolf Stern call his firstborn son? Abraham, of course because he was born 1797, six years after the grandfather, the father of Wolfgang was uh, uh, passed away. And here we could also read that uh, he was familiant in Krudenitz, in Krudenitz uh, just near the town of Sviau, and that he changed his, he asked to change his family position in 1809, to uh, Wittingau, where he probably lived. So now we know a lot about his family and that uh, the father of, uh, of Abraham uh, and Joseph Stern uh, was pink as wolf. And uh, I found even more about this family because there are some local histories uh, written in the interwar years in the 1920s and 1930s, published in, in yearbooks and uh, written in German, and, but they are online now. And here is one of, about uh, the use of Sviehau. And there you could read from a local uh, Jewish census from 1747 that in that town lived a man called Wolf Pinkas with his family. Another man called Pinkas Wolf with his wife Fradel and their little son Abraham. Here we probably have Pinkas Wolf with his first wife Franziska Hirschman and their little son Abraham. He was born in the uh, 1730s, according to how old he was when he passed away in 1791. There are new records, new writer records for the this time, uh, this period of the 18th uh, century, of course. They start in the uh, late eight, uh, 1780s. And here is another, it's a tax uh, record, a conscription of uh, the use in Sweden from 1782. Here you could see the Pinkas Wolf own house number 11. And it says also in the history, uh, local history or in the conscription from 1782 that he now had a dis distillery in Neuhaus. He had moved to Neuhaus, and he, but he still owned a house, house number three or, or later house number, they changed the house number to uh, to, uh, 201. He owned that house in 1782 and before him, in 1729, it was owned by Wolf Pinkas, probably his father. And in 1798, he sold it to Solomon Sicher. No, he couldn't sell it to Solomon Sicher in 1798, because Pinkas Wolf, or as he called him in 1793, he died 1793. But I figured out how uh, Solomon Sifi could got the house from Pinkas Wolf. Because I found another local history about the Jewish uh, 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 population in Neuhaus. And here you could read uh, also uh, uh, in that the leaser of the distillery in Neuhaus between 1766 and 1785 was Pinkas Wolf and from 1785 to 93 was Elias Stern and then he died and the new leaser was the uh, widow of Elias Stern, Franzen. We know that it was the Fergele, the second wife. But those two leasers was no two leasers. It's, uh, the, the author of the local uh, history didn't figure out, he thought that they were two persons. It was one and the same person. It was Pinkas Wolf, and he changed his name to Elias Stern. And uh, the new Lisa was his widow. And she left the distillery in 1799 to a friend, Anna Bubele, a business partner of her, uh, her husband, Isaac Bubele, was a used to be a business partner of Elias Stern. You could read in the history as well. And 
she sold, uh, she left the distillery to, to her in 1799. And she sold the house probably in 1798 to Solomon Sicher. So now we know the, um, the story of Joseph Stern. He was born about 1750. We have no white records, so we don't know really. But he was born as Joshua Pinkas. He was son of Pinkas, Wolf, or grandson of Wolf Pinkas. He married 1775 as Joshua Pinkas. He lived 1783 in Neubistitz as, uh, and had his distillery there as Joel Pinkas. He got his, his first son in 1781. He called him Wolf after the grandfather Wolf Pinkas. And in 1793, he called himself Joseph Stern, he had uh, been forced to adopt the uh, fixed semi, uh, family name Stern. And he still have that, of course, in uh, 1811, when we, uh, the last time we have some record of him. We don't know really when he died. So let's go on to, to the next case study. Now we are in a quite other area of Central Europe. We are in Southern Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, the man that I'm uh, researching is called Louis Strauss. And, but he was born as Löw Strauss. He was born in, in a small village called Fricht in uh, the Grand Duchy of uh, Nassau. And he died as a merchant in Gießen, that's the capital of the federal state of Hesse. And he died in, the, uh, in 1917. Here we have a map so you can uh, uh, see where we are. We, uh, we are Gießen here is here, it's north of Frankfurt, that's more known for the most people. Uh, had a, a classical uh, Jewish uh, population. The Rothschilds are from Frankfurt, as you know. Um, but the Strauss family lived in Gießen. And this Louis Strauss that was born as Löw Strauss, he was born in Fricht, a small village here uh, in uh, West southwest of Gießen. And here you see a, a map of, of uh, the present uh, map of the Federal Republic of Germany. You see where uh, Gießen is here, where the number two is. I looked for Lev Strauss in family search. Uh, I found him also in ancestry because they have the civil records of, of uh, Prussia and, and Hesse be, became part of, of the kingdom of Prussia and later uh, the German uh, empire. Uh, and Lev Strauss, he married, he was born 1851. He married in, in 1879, a woman, uh, Jeanette Bayfus from Gießen. Uh, and we can read here that he, uh, that the father of Lev Strauss was Isaac Strauss and the mother was Rebecca, but let's go to the, the original document. But I think, I don't think that this is the original document because it's uh, written uh, by a typewriter. So it's probably a copy of the, the original document. The, the, uh, the format is the original document, but it's typed let, uh, later, I don't know why. But here you can read that he was born uh, uh, in May um, uh, uh, um, 51, 1851, in Fricht. Um, and he was a merchant, Löw Strauss, and he was son of uh, the, another merchant, <laughs> Isaac Strauss and uh, Rebecca uh, born uh, Mainzer. And here you could read about his parents in law also, but that's uh, we could do another time. Now we're looking for the patronyms of the patronymic of, of this uh, Louis Strauss or Leo Strauss. Uh, as you saw here, uh, 
if you go back here, you can see that the original um, data for the family search or for ancestry is uh, uh, the marriage record in uh, the Hesse State Archives. So, so I went directly to the Hesse Federal State Archives. They have a lot of online records uh, free. Uh, so it's much better than uh, pay uh, money to ancestry or to to look for it at family search you can look at the original here here we have something that could call a uh, chevra kadisha records or a tombstone records from the jewish cemetery of Gies and, and here you, you find isaac strauss dead in Gießen 1881 and, and born in Frisch. We have his uh, wife here, Rebecca, also born in, in, in Frisch and, and dead in, in 1888 in, in, um, in Gießen. This, this information you can find in U bar also at UCN. So now we know Isaac Strauss, born in Frisch in Nassau, died in uh, 1881 in Gießen in Hesse. What to do then? Yes, yeah, sometimes it's easy enough to do like this. Just Google. And if you are looking for German uh, sites, and you read German, it's better to you uh, Google in German. So I. I just uh, um, wrote into Google here, Juden in Frisch, that use in Frisch. And what happened? Yeah, I got, a, a, a got into a, a portal of uh, historic uh, Jewish um, communities all, from all over Germany. And this is the site for the Jewish community of Frisht. And here you could read a lot of, about uh, the community. Um, but here down it says, I know that uh, the Jews in uh, Nassau had to adopt uh, fixed family surnames as late as 1841. And here you could read about them. And uh, I've uh, translated the German text into English here. So when adopting Jewish family names in 1841, the families choose the following name. And here, the widow of Löw Isaac and her son Israel Löw took the surname Strauss. Nothing about Isaac Strauss. But I thought that this information was interesting enough. So I uh, looked even further into uh, the uh, Hesse archives. And what did I found? I found three tax records, one for the period 1820 to 1840, and one for the period 1844 to 1865. And in between, we have the mandatory uh, legislation about fixed surnames for, Jewish, for the Jewish population from 1841. So here we have in the first period mentioned Löb Isaac living in uh, uh, Frist. And here, after the mandatory uh, law was implemented uh, about uh, fixed surnames, this Löw Isaac seems to have uh, been dead because it says here that Löw Strauss widow and Israel Strauss. Yeah, they took the name Strauss. Löw Isaac took, uh, didn't take the name uh, Strauss because he died before 1841. And the third tax uh, record, it was an earlier tax record. And it was from 1811, and it consisted of a lot of information. The whole family of this Löw Isaac. And I was lucky also to understand that in this small village of Frisch, there lived only three Jewish families. And one of them was this Löw Isaac, 
born in the late 18th century, 45 year, 44 years old, 1811. The widow of Le Strauss was sailor, one year younger than her husband. Their firstborn son, eight years old, 1811, was Israel, that also took the name Strauss. And the second born son was Isaac. And he was probably living some other place when he had to take a fixed surname, but he took also the name Strauss. And then they had a third son and two daughters. So now we have the situation clear. We have Isaac born 1806 in Fricht as Isaac Löw, son of Löw Isaac, born about 1767. And he was, of course, son of Isaac, born some time in the middle of the 18th century. That's the only thing we know about him. There are no records telling that could tell us more. But we know, know that Isaac must have adopted, together with his mother Selah and brother Israel, the fixed surname Strauss, 1841. He died in Gießen as Isaac Strauss. And he had a son born 1851 in Fricht. And he was born Löw Strauss because that was after the law of uh, fixed surname. But he got his first, uh, his given name, his first name from his grandfather, Löw Isaac, who was dead then. He has passed away before the grandson uh, was born. He was passed away before the uh, uh, name law was implemented in somewhere in the late 1840s. And in 1917, Löw Isaac died in Gießen, but now he called himself Louis Strauss. And that was very common that you changed in Anyhow, in the 20th century or in the late 19th century, we have now the modern society and, and um, the, a lot of people wanted to have other names than uh, names that implemented that they were Jewish, had Jewish descent. So he took probably Louis, that was more common name then live among uh, the gentle before uh, the gentle population too. So that's my second uh, um, case study. So let's see if we can manage to have uh, the third one here before my time is over. And this is uh, uh, perhaps uh, the hard one. It's about nicknames used as surnames and they not only changed every generation, like the patronymics, they changed during, within a generation, during the lifespan of one and the same um, person. And they were usually not inherited by their descendants. There are different types of nicknames, and you remember, you recognize these uh, names, of course, because many of these nicknames become became fixed surnames when the people had to adopt fixed names. And you can tell about different types because you can uh, uh, um, talk about personal ca characteristics like Glick. Uh, Grossman, Heller, and so on. You could have those nicknames out of occupation, uh, like a Kirchner or Martner. That's a, the, Martner is a person that uh, taking taxes, and Reiniger is a butcher, Schneider is a tailor, Schreiber is a, 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 a scribe. Uh, you can have toponyms, uh, and they were always. Uh, indicating that people were from those places. They were not living there. They came from Brody or they came from Bohemia. They came from fear. They were not living in fear because they got those nicknames as 
people recognize them. This guy, okay, he's Polak, he's from Poland. And Österreich, he's from Austria. And Fürth, he's from Fürth, but he's living in Prague and so on. And then you have the Hebrew, of course, Korn, Korn, Levi. Uh, they are well known. Menake, that's a butcher. Sofer is a shrine. And then you have the frozen patronymics. Some families, when they had to adopt uh, fixed surnames, they took the last patronymic and made a fixed surname out of the Jewish people have what we think is given names as their surnames. But when they got uh, this given name as a surname, all descendants had the Salomon as their surname. It was not any longer a patronymic because it didn't, it didn't change every generation. In Galicia, in, in uh, uh, the part of, of uh, the Austrian Empire, where the Jewish population was very big, uh, and uh, it's today the southern part of Poland and the western part of Ukraine. You hear it every day in the news today about Lviv. It was called Lembai in uh, when it was Galicia and part of the Austrian um, Empire. In Galicia, the authorities constructed surnames on long lists for the Jewish population. And they, they called the man up and said, your name will be Goldberg. And the next guy, he was uh, told that his name was Goldblatt. And the third guy, Goldkuhl, and next guy, Rosenberg. And the, the, next guy Rosenblatt and then Rosenstein. And then they started on with another Goldberg, another Goldblatt or another Grossman, another uh, Rosenstein or Liechtenstein. And those new guys, they were not related or near related to the first Goldberg or Gold Grossman. So beware of that when you have your ancestry in, in Galicia. Now to the example from the 18th century Prague, and this is uh, something that I have done in collaboration with my friend Randy Schoenberg, uh, and uh, this was really a challenge. It's about uh, uh, the grandfather or my uh, grandmother's grandmother. His name was Simon Reinige. He died 1831 in Prague and he was son of Koppel. Uh, and you can see his death records here. And here is the tombstone records or Sheva Kadisha records. Here he's called Menake instead of Reinige. So he had one uh, surname, Livig, another surname when he was buried. You see him here as Simche Koppel. Koppel is his patronymic because his father's given name was Koppel. So let's go on. Here is the father of Simon Reininger. He had three nicknames during his lifespan. In fact, he had four. So this is very confusing when you start to look into it, that one and the same person during his lifetime used several different surnames. Koppel Reiniger, in a list of house owners affected by the great fire in Prague, 1754, then he called himself Koppel Reiniger. Uh, I don't know when he died. He died before uh, the mandatory law of fixed surnames were implemented in 1787 and later. He, he, but his wife died in 1787. In the death record, she, it says that the widow of Koppel Reiniger, Esther, died 1787. We have a duplicate of that death, death, death record of Prague. And there it says that Esther is the widow of Koppel Schechter. So this is he had two names when he, his wife died in the same um, day, so to say. She died in the in uh, same year. And if we go back to 1751, 
in the in a very special census called sworn declarations. In, in fact, it was uh, declarations that uh, all Jews that wanted to return to Prague had to fill in and they had to uh, give a sworn declaration that they had lived in Prague before 1840. 1748, when the Empress Maria Theresia expelled all the Jews from Prague. And then later, some years later, when she was forced to let them back, people have to fill in this sworn declaration that they had uh, really lived in Prague and had been expelled. Then Koppel Reinig called himself Koppel Auserheder. And and he lived in Sigoyner in Prague with his wife, Estrel. And here you have a, a map of uh, the old Jewish town of, of Prague. And you, uh, the Sigoyner was a synagogue. Here you have the synagogue. And he lived uh, opposite the Sigoyner uh, synagogue because there was the meat market. The Fleischbänke, you have a, a picture of the Fleischbänke here, it's not from the 18th century, it's probably from the early 19th or mid 19th century. Everything is torn down here, it's, uh, nothing is left, not even the Sigoyne synagogue. Some other synagogues are, uh, are still there. But And look here what, what the street is called where uh, Koppel aus Eder lived. It's called Fleischmarkt, that's a meat market in German. So butcher in English is in Yiddish a schechter. In Hebrew, it could be a menaker, a special uh, sort of butcher. In German, Reiniger uh, is a man that purifies. And Aus Eder is a man that removes blood vessels. And Eder is blood vessels. That's an old fashioned uh, German word. And all these words, this Koppel uh, Reiniger used as his nickname, as a surname. So then I was looking for siblings of this Koppel uh, Reiniger together with R Randy. And I found uh, a sibling, Meyer Marcus Reiniger, son of Simche. He died 1790 in Prague. Here you have his death record. He was buried as Menaker, Meyer Menaker. He died as Meyer Reiniger. And he, 30 years earlier, he married as Meyer Reiniger. But in 1788, when he had to change uh, his uh, surname or to adopt the fixed surname. He told the authorities that his name was Meyer Menaker, living as Meyer Menaker, and he wanted to change it to Marcus Reiniger, and he not, died as Meyer Reiniger. So this is a little bit confusing, but it's the same guy. I found him also in the sworn declaration. Then he was an orphan. His father, Simon Reiniger, was dead, it said, and he lived at, uh, with a couple, an older couple, uh, a tailor called Salmon or Simmel Paul, and his wife, Shaye Ederer. And they were foster parents of this orphan. And uh, Shaya Ederer, she died uh, about 1753-54, and in the name register of the Ulu Cemetery, or from the tombstones, they have done such registry, and I have had a transcribed copy of that. It's easier to read, but here is the original. Uh, it says that Shaya uh, married to Simmel Paul, Samuel Paul, she was but, you see that BT, uh, she was daughter of Simcha Menake. And she was married to this uh, uh, Solomon Paul, 1737. Uh, and then she's, uh, uh, her surname is Eder. So Simcha Menake was he the same as Simcha Reiniger? 
was the father of Shea Ederer, Sim Shiminaki, the same person as Sim Shereininger, the father of this orphan that lived uh, in the household of Shea Ederer, yes. Meyer Menaker lived at his older sister. And that was not, that was evident, of course. He was an orphan, he was a child, and his father was dead, and probably his mother too, so he lived with his, uh, with his uh, sister. Here we have another uh, sibling, Moshe Moses Reiniger, dead 1785, married to Golda Meshotek. We have the death record here. He called himself Marsha uh, Reiniger. Here is uh, the um, uh, name register of the Old Jewish Cemetery. Here he is Marsha Ben Sim Shamenaker. And in the sworn uh, declaration from 1751, he called himself uh, uh, Marsha Simches. He uses his patronymic. His father is Tim Sheminaker. And what do he have? Uh, what is his uh, occupation in 1751? He is an Auseder. What is an Auseder? He's a butcher. He's butcher too. So we have uh, uh, three butchers here. We have several Simsche, Simon Reiniger buried as Simsche Menaker. We have the Simsche Reiniger, father of Meyer Reiniger, buried as Meyer Menaker. This man died before 1751. Otherwise, uh, the Meyer uh, Menaker couldn't be an orphan. Then we have the Simon Simsche, firstborn son of Koppel is the grandfather of the grandmother of my grandmother. He died 1831 in Prague. And I found a third Simsche that was a cousin of this, could have been a cousin about this Simon Simsche, son of Koppel. He was firstborn son of Enoch Reiniger, dead 1815 in Prague. And who was this Enoch Reiniger? that has uh, named his firstborn Simsche also, or Simon. Yeah, you will see. Because back to Koppel Auseder and his sworn declaration when he lived in, uh, at the Sigoyner in Prague. In this sworn declaration, you could read that there were, he had another orphan whose name was Enoch. And he was son of Simsche Reiniger or Simsche Menaker. And this Enoch Reiniger was the same that passed away 1813 in Prague. And when his daughter died 1835, he was called Enoch Sofer, not Enoch Reiniger, as he called himself when he died 1813. And when his son Joachim Moses was recorded in a Familianten book. His father, Enoch, is recorded as Enoch Schreiber. And in the census 1793, Enoch Reiniger's occupation was recorded in German as Seengeboten Schreiber. That is a guy that uh, uh, writes down the Ten Commandments if you uh, translate it from German. He uh, didn't do that, of course, only. He, uh, but he was a scribe. He wrote Siddur's and holy texts. And uh, Schreiber in German is Schreib in English. So then my concluding uh, question here, and was Randy's too, when we did this together. Was Simsche Reiniger, alias Simsche Menaker, father of Koppel Reiniger, alias Koppel Ausreder, Koppel Schechter, with his wife Estrel, Mosche Reiniger or Mosche Simsche, who was an Ausrederer, Enoch Reiniger, 
also known as Ian Sofer or Ian Schreiber, Meyer Reiniger, also not, uh, known as Marcus Menacher, and Shaye Ederer, married to the tailor Salomon Paul. They were siblings because Randy found them in the uh, Jewish census of 1729 in Prague. And here we have the father, he called himself Simche Bunzel, but later he's called Simche Reiniger or Simche Menacher. He was a Fleischhaus Ederer, or he called himself Fleischhaus Ederer. That's a butcher also in German. He was, uh, his wife was Brindel, and they had three sons in 1729, Koppel, Enoch, and Moises, and two daughters, Shaya and Peyele. The youngest son, Meyer, the first one I started with after Koppel, uh, he was born 1732, so he's not in the, the 1729 uh, census. Here we have Koppel Reiniger, who called himself Koppel Ausreder when he married 1742, his wife Estelle, he called himself Koppel Reiniger when his house was burnt down 1754 in the Great Fire in Prague. He, called, uh, he was called Koppel Schechter when his wife Estelle died 1787, and he was called Koppel Ausreder also in the Sworn Declaration from 1751. But he married already in 1736. His first wife, Estrel, was his second wife. In 1736, he, might, uh, he married a, 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 a girl called Shaye. Her name was Shaye Pisek. And that was the uh, surname of Estrel too. Shaye was the older sister of Estrel, but she died already in uh, 1741. And that's why a couple uh, remarried her younger sister. That's very common also, as you probably know, uh, uh, at those time in the Jewish population. But here couple had uh, his fourth nickname as surname. He called himself Bunzel, as his father called himself in the 1729 census. And Bunsen indicates that the family were from Brunsla, a, a city in um, northeast of Prague. So now I'm coming to the end. I'm probably done a little more than my hour, but we still have, if you are, are ready, some uh, time for questions, I think. You will find almost all person mentioned uh, above in my lecture in the UCN Austria Czech database or in the U bar uh, at uh, UCN. Of course, you don't uh, get all the uh, combinations that you have heard about here, but you can check all the names there. Here you have some books about uh, use surnames, very uh, useful when you are researching um, surnames, when they came into uh, the families and when the different laws came, uh, were implemented. There is some, a little booklet also, it's out of print by Alexander Beider about surnames in, in Prague. And here is my last uh, slide. Here you have uh, my email and you can get it from afterwards, probably also from, from Avram. So this is what I had to uh, lecture about. So thank you. Sure, thank you very much. This was so informative. Um, there are questions in the Q&A if you have some time to, to look through and just pull out which ones you think would be uh, most relevant yeah. to the audience. So it's getting dark in Sweden now. It's The time is 10 o'clock in the p.m. So, oh. <laughs> How long had Christians used patronyms in the same regions? Yeah, in the same regions, I think the Christian 
population, they, they started with, with uh, fixed surnames uh, earlier than the Jewish population. That's why the Soviets wanted the, uh, the Jewish population to have uh, fixed surnames too. So I know that uh, the majority uh, population, the Christian population in the Scandinavian countries were some of the, the last countries to abandon uh, patronymic. They did it uh, in the early nine, uh, 20th century. So. Can we get an increased volume? Yeah. What about the use of Hakoen and Kohen? Yeah, yeah, the uh, people used the uh, Kohen, the, the Kohen, uh, people that had uh, Kohen ancestry used the uh, Kohen uh, name, but uh, not all of them. And uh, all that called themselves Kohen was not Kohenites. So, so you have to, to, uh, to look for that also. So it's it's not obvious that people that call themselves Korn or Khan or Korn are Kornites. And some Kornites are, are call themselves something else. Pashonsky uh, some is we can find no one in the family who actually has that name. I don't know really. Susan asks here. I'm not very good in 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 what's happened in Belarus. My my family is mainly from 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 uh, Bohemia and Hungary and and Galicia. So is there a handout to syllabus? Yes, you can get my slides if you you send a mail to me. I can get. Uh, Make a PDF. You can get it. It's no, no. It's not secret. Any uh, anything secret. I use answers. Is some one or two? Sandy uh, ask. Use some of my info, but it wasn't correct. Wrong birthday and my mom wrong suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, of course. Uh, problem if you look into people's uh, family trees there are a lot of wrong details and so on you 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 should be very uh, very um, you should don't copy from family trees online if you don't have uh, sources indication where uh, what sources they have used uh, um, because there are a lot of, of wrong things. But it could be uh, uh, good for uh, your questions or for hypotheses, how to uh, research the, these family trees, but there are some young uh, things in the family trees. Not all of them, of course. And I said in my lecture also that Going to Yeni, for instance, there we are a lot of our, uh, I am a curator, Randy are curator, a lot of other people are curators and, and we fix things that are, are, are wrong. That not to say that something are wrong that too, but I think it's better. How do the genealogical services take advantage of patronymics? Do they record a uh, record? Yeah, this is a good question. Sam Glasser asks, uh, patronymic doesn't function uh, online if you, when you are looking for people. If you search people uh, with their patronymic, you will get a lot of people uh, or, or matches that are not uh, the right matches because Patronymic doesn't say that you are uh, a relative of another person with the same patronymic, often your aunt. A patronymic says only that uh, your uh, that the father of uh, the son has the patronymic as his uh, given name. It says nothing about the uh, relation to other persons with for instance, Pinkas Wolf, uh, my example in my lecture now, 
there was a lot of people that have Wolf as a patronymic, of course, and a lot of other people that have Pink as a patronymic, and they were not related to, to Abraham Stern or you, uh, Joseph Stern. Where can I find the marriage records of Bohemia, René uh, Klisch? Yeah, you can find them at the uh, Narodny archive, at the, the state archive of um, uh, um, the Czech Republic at, uh, in Prague. It's called Vademekum. But uh, look for the state archive of, of uh, Czech Republic. Or you could mail me and I could mail you, uh, answer uh, with a mail with the uh, link. Corny, is it true that some Jews in Germany paid Christian families to use their surname when the law went into effect? I don't know really. I don't think it's true. Because uh, of course, many of the, uh, those surnames that we think are Jewish aren't Jewish because there are a lot of Germans called Neumann or Grossmann and they have no Jewish ancestry. Uh, so uh, many Jews took German surnames or got surnames from the authorities. I'm looking for, Dani asked here, I'm looking for my Italian paternal ancestors originating from Girona, Spain. Yeah, this is Sephardic probably. You can look it up perhaps in this book about Sephardic surnames. My great grandfather came from somewhere in the pale of the settlement. Dr. Pruitt, maybe we'll do um, one more question and then yeah. we'll wrap up. Yeah, that, this is very general questions, of course. If you have your, your uh, ancestry in the pale of settlement, go to ye or I, you probably find them there. Will the slides be sent out to the uh, attendees? No, but if you send a ma mail to me, I uh, will uh, answer uh, with a mail with the slides. Where can I find the record from Tabor? It's at the uh, Vadebekum, at the uh, Narodny archive in, in, in uh, Prague. So it's perhaps, we are done now with the questions, Avram. Can you hear Hello? me? Yeah, I'm okay. ready. Oh, we are, it's a quarter past, past 10 now or here in Sweden, so perhaps. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. This was really amazing and very informative and looks like there were a lot of questions and thank you for going through some of them. Um, so we recorded this session, so if anybody wants to review it afterwards, uh, we encourage you to do so. It will be on our YouTube channel, and we will let you know when that video is live. Um, we do have a number of talks coming up over the next few weeks, so please be on the lookout for the full schedule. We'll post it on the discussion group, social media, emails, and we uh, wish all of you, wherever you are in the world, a wonderful rest of the day. And we thank you for joining us. Dr. Fjord, thank you again. This was really wonderful. We hope to have you again. Take care.